if your children went trick-or-treating this past Halloween, there's a good chance they came home with a particular brand of candy. A brand based on a family name, and that family with its own unsolved and seriously mysterious mystery. I'm John Lorden, and today we're looking into the disappearance of Helen Voorhees Brock. A Chicago original, the Brock's Candy Company is famous throughout the country as a maker of many childhood memories. Those special little pieces of entertainment for the taste buds highlighted our holidays, our after-school trips to the candy store, and even our visits to the homes of our grandparents, where we delighted in the struggle to separate a chunk of corn syrupy goodness from the suspiciously old clump shellacked into a glass candy dish. The layers of dust be damned, we were having that Brock's candy. The company, started by Emil J. Brock in 1904, focused on individually wrapping their products, guaranteeing freshness and cleanliness in the minds of the consumers with a sweet tooth. Brock's exploded in popularity and became so prosperous that four factories were built, and by the 1920s, the company was offering over 100 varieties of candy, churning out over 2 million tons of the sweet stuff per year. Emil's wife, Catherine, passed away in 1924, and his company had generated enough revenue that he retired, moved to Florida, and remarried a year later. His sons, Edwin and Frank, who had made candy alongside their father since the beginning, were left in charge. Edwin was made the president of the company and Frank its vice president. Brock's continued on making the infamous candy corn of Halloween, the conversation hearts of Valentine's Day, and a kaleidoscope of flavors in the everyday candies, with labels like Perky's, Discs, Royals, and so much more. In 1958, the company introduced the concept called Pick-A-Mix, where customers could take a scoop of the individually wrapped sugar bombs and pay for them by the pound. In 1965, older brother Edwin passed away at the age of 77, leaving the company to Frank. However, Frank was getting along in his years too, and he preferred to spend time with his third wife, a woman 21 years his junior by the name of Helen. They had met at a country club in Florida where the red-headed Helen worked as a coat check girl. They married in 1951 on Brock's Glenview estate, and the couple enjoyed a lavish lifestyle. Frank doted on Helen buying her Cadillacs and Lincolns in pink and salmon. In addition to their mansion in Glenview, Illinois, they had a penthouse in Florida. Frank had been a fanatic for horse racing for many years and introduced his wife to the sport, buying her a collection of racehorses. Helen was a very caring person, particularly with animals, taking in many stray dogs. So becoming involved with horses was an understandable next step. She had instructed the handlers to never be cruel, and to the jockeys, the animals were never to be whipped, win or lose. Frank allowed his wife everything, even allowing her to have a house built for her father on Tappan Lake, Ohio, and one for her brother too. A boat and a Cadillac for her father, an outdoor pool for her brother. Helen oversaw the expansion of the Glenview home, adding an entire wing to the structure, and why not? Anything she wanted, Frank happily gave. Back in the late 1960s, having millions of dollars was like being a multi-billionaire today. But the empire built on sweets would turn sour under the erosion of time. On January 31st, 1970, Frank passed away, leaving Helen a fortune. Devastated by the loss, she remained living in the Glenview home, Rarely socializing, though she continued caring for her racehorses and traveled occasionally to the home in Florida or to New York City for the nightlife or to see a show. In the Chicago area, she became known as the Candy Heiress or the Candy Lady. She is also the owner of a very special 1971 Rolls-Royce convertible, magenta in color, though it's been referred to as Brock Candy Purple. To neighbors, she became reclusive, though she still spoke to her childhood friends in Ohio on the telephone regularly. She also delved into the world of the paranormal, welcoming psychics and mediums into her home. In 1973, she met a man named Richard Bailey, 
a horse trader and owner of a riding stable in Morton Grove. Helen found herself drawn to the handsome, well-spoken, and friendly man, and a relationship, both personal and professional, dawned. Richard sold her a few horses. And while none of them would turn out to be race winners, they certainly benefited from Helen's care. Helen soon began taking Richard with her when she traveled to Florida, New York, and even to Tappan Lake. Helen, by 1974, was a proven philanthropist that gave hundreds of thousands of dollars to animal anti-cruelty organizations and founded the Helen V. Brock Foundation. The foundation, which still exists today, gives away millions of dollars per year to fight animal cruelty and also provides scholarships. Her relationship with Richard Bailey thrived, and, on the surface at least, the couple seemed happy. Over time, however, something changed radically. In February of 1977, Helen flew to Minneapolis for a physical at the Mayo Clinic in nearby Rochester. Receiving a good bill of health for a 65-year-old, she left the clinic, stopped at a department store, and purchased several cosmetics. The woman who worked at the store later recalled that Helen asked her to hurry as her houseman was waiting. Taking her purchases with her and stepping out of the store, the candy lady walked off into the night and was never seen or heard from again. Days went by, and though airline records show that Helen Brock had purchased a return ticket to Chicago for that February, the 17th, a Thursday, no one recalled seeing the regal redhead on the airplane. Jack Matlick, the houseman that Helen had mentioned to the store clerk in Rochester, claimed that he had picked her up at O'Hare International Airport that very night and had last seen Helen when he dropped her off at the same location the following Monday morning, just before 7 a.m. She was to catch a flight to Florida, he has said, to stay there for a period of time. Helen's friends from Ohio and Florida would call the Glenview home only to be told by Matlick that Helen was not available and would return their call. Of course, she didn't. Matlick went on to forge Helen's name on several checks totaling $15,000 and made out to him, which he cashed. He lived in the house, continued deflecting calls, and when police finally came knocking on the door, he stuck to his story. Months after Helen's disappearance, Matlick was dismissed from his position as caretaker of the Brock home and later evicted by lawyers with the power of attorney over the Brock estate. He was never charged with a crime, and the case of the missing heiress went cold. Helen Voorhees Brock was declared deceased in 1984, seven years after her disappearance. An attorney for the estate, John Mank, searched the Glenview home for a copy of Helen Brock's will. Instead, he found a set of her luggage, complete with airline tags that indicated her date of disappearance. This might seem to substantiate Matlick's claim that Helen Brock did return home that night, but it certainly doesn't absolve him of his apparent cover-up and fraud. There's also the possibility that the luggage came home without her. Richard Bailey was eventually arrested for fraud not relating to the Brock estate. In 1995, a newly elected Illinois state's attorney, Steve Miller, decided to have another look at unsolved murders. Adapting his method, which he called follow the fraud, solve the murder. Miller uncovered a myriad of criminals involved in the horse trade at the time when Helen Brock had her hand in this game. He focused on Bailey, still in prison at that time, and he took it from there. Silas Jane, head of the Jane family, had already been implicated in many crimes, including the 1965 bombing of his brother George's car, which had missed the intended target and killed a young woman by the name of Cheryl Lynn Rood. Police did not have enough evidence to arrest Silas for the murder of Rood, a horsewoman known for her horse riding skills who worked for George Jane at his business, Tricolor Stables. Silas was later convicted for hiring a successful hit on his brother George in 1970, and he served eight years in prison. Silas died in 1987, but the investigation intensified, eventually revealing a crime ring resulting in the indictments of 23 stable owners, trainers, and veterinarians. One of these veterinarians, a man named Tom Burns, was known as the Sandman. Burns was one of a few men that would euthanize horses by electrocution. 
so that the owners could collect the insurance money. Even after changing his name to Tim Ray in 1989, he couldn't avoid arrest, and he agreed to tell all for a lighter sentence, including whatever he knew about the disappearance of Helen Brock. With the FBI's assistance, it was revealed that dozens of horses were euthanized unnecessarily, but it's believed that the practice had become so accepted by the equestrian community that the number may have been closer to 100, all for insurance payouts. The racket was blown wide open, but even so, without the body of Helen Brock, a confession for her murder would have to be attained from someone. During Miller's investigation, witnesses stated that in January of 1977, Richard Bailey took Helen to the stables to see some horses for her to buy, but the state of the animals was poor enough that she passed on the purchase. Then, Helen insisted that she be allowed to see some of her breeding stock that she had recently bought. The horses were in such sickly condition that Helen exploded, claiming she had been cheated and she threatened to turn Bailey in for fraud. All of this information was enough to charge Bailey with the murder. And as Bailey was certain that he would prevail in court because Helen's body was never found, he agreed to a bench trial. Instead of being absolved of the murder, the judge found in the state attorney's favor and added 20 years to Bailey's prison sentence. But is that all there is to it? Certainly, Bailey didn't act alone, and there is the suspicious behavior of Jack Matlick. At the very least, Matlick's deception about Helen's whereabouts delayed the discovery of her disappearance, but worse, the crimes of forgery and fraud he committed while he remained in the Brock home brought him only scrutiny by police in the newspapers. Further, employees of the estate did report that several strange people were seen on the property that evening, and then in the following days, Matlick had some rooms of the estate painted. Nothing was proven, and Matlick was never charged with a crime. To add to the mystery, Charles Voorhees went out of his way to travel from the very home his sister had built for him in Tappan Lake, Ohio, to the Glenview estate to search for and then burn Helen's diary in the fireplace. When asked about this, Charles stated that he did it to preserve his sister's dignity as she wrote all about her paranormal experiences, including her samples of what's known as auto writing, a supposed form of spirit-driven scribbling. After the diary burning, he left Matlick to reside in the home and returned to Ohio. Is it possible that Helen's housemen and very own brother were accomplices in her disappearance? Their part in the crime will likely never be known, as Charles Voorhees passed away in 2002, and Jack Matlick died in a Pennsylvania nursing home back in 2009. The only one left that served any time for the murder of Helen Brock was Richard Bailey, also known as the Galloping Gigolo. He has served most of the 30-year sentence, and then he was released in 2019. As of that time, he relocated to Orlando, Florida. The disappearance of Helen Brock is still an open case, despite Bailey's having served time for it. Theories and rumors about who did it remain. It's been said that the Spilotro brothers, a Chicago-based family of mobsters that were otherwise known as the Hole in the Wall gang, had Helen abducted and murdered to keep her silent about the horse trade, but that can't be proven. Another person is said to have admitted to the murder of Brock. Red Wamet, working with the FBI as an undercover informant, has stated that Kenneth Hansen, who once worked for several horse stables in the Chicagoland area, confessed to being the murderer of three boys in 1955. The boys had intended to go riding horses at the Idle Hour stable when Hansen abducted and murdered the trio, Robert Peterson, John Schussler, and his younger brother Anton. This admission led to Hansen's arrest for the murders, which was until then unsolved. Well, Met has maintained that Kenneth confessed to the abduction and murder of Helen Brock. To support this theory, Joe Plemons came forward in 2005 claiming that Kenneth Hansen phoned him one night in February of 1977, telling him to meet Hansen at his Tinley Park horse stable. Plemons did so and met with Ken and his brother Kurt a hitman for the Spilotro brothers. Kurt opened the trunk to a Cadillac he and Ken had driven to the stable, 
and the beaten Helen Brock was lying inside, possibly even still alive. Kurt handed Joe Plamens a gun and told him to shoot the candy heiress twice, or he would be killed on the spot. Joe stated that he did so, and that a ruby ring fell from the deceased woman's hand, which Joe pocketed and presented to police as proof. However, it couldn't be proven that the ring had ever belonged to Helen. There was no DNA on the item, and no one that knew her recognized the ring. Plemons went on to say that Helen's body was disposed of in the molten slag of a nearby steel mill. Since then, Kenneth Hansen reversed his statements to Wemet and said that he had no part in the crime. None of these statements can be proven, however, as Helen's trail ends there. Kenneth Hansen died in prison in 2007, while Kurt preceded him in death in 1993. Could the strange people that Brock's employees saw on the Glenview estate have been Kenneth and Kurt Hansen? Is the information that Joe Plemons came forward with in 2005 the truest account of Helen's demise? He can also no longer speak about it as he died in 2016. With all those that were involved in the horse syndicate of the 1970s having passed away, with the exception of Richard Bailey, who's now in his 90s, the truth of who abducted and killed Helen Voorhees Brock may never be known for certain. Unless the location of her body is discovered, or we happen to get a deathbed confession from someone, this case has very little chance of being solved. The candy heiress, the philanthropist, and lover of animals was a prime target for one or more con men. It's very likely she paid the ultimate price for threatening to reveal the cruelties carried out on innocent animals by greedy, heartless people. She probably never fully understood just how dangerous the people around her really were until it was too late. Her final resting location remaining seriously mysterious. If you're enjoying this show, please check out Seriously Mysterious, the podcast. We have over 150 episodes waiting for you.